Amen. All right. Parents, make sure you got the right child or, uh, or not. You can help others out, each other out. Um, or you can head to the family room if you want to do that. that. That was funny. Hey, I am so glad that you're here today. And I wonder, I wonder, did you catch it? Did you catch it? Three times. Dr. Luke wants to see something that we just might miss. And a lot of people miss it. The whole focus of the story is found in the repeated line, in the manger, in a manger, in a manger. And what I want us to do is focus in on what this is all about. Because again, it's possible to miss it. And did you catch that the angel said, it's a sign. Now kids, listen, you know this, a sign is not the thing, a sign is pointing to something. Like you may have seen a sign coming in, Park City's Baptist Church. That's not the church. It points to the fact that you're here, right? There's something deeper going on. You could get to the Grand Canyon and it says Grand Canyon. That's not the Grand Canyon. It points to something much bigger that's happening here. And today on this day of days, I want us to get underneath what is this all about? That the baby is wrapped up and placed in a manger of all things. Many of us have heard this through the years and some people just kind of consider that's just some fantastical story. It seems like some nursery rhyme or something. Luke places all of this in historical context and he says, here's what, here's what has happened. What is this in a manger? What is this all about? What we'll see here, we're gonna answer three questions. Uh, what is this? Okay, it's a, it's a gift. We're going to see that. He's the gift. But what, what is the gift exactly? And, and what does it look like? And how, how do you get it? Who is he? What's he like? And where is he found, you could say? That's what's answered here in this story. So first of all, what is the gift? Well, the angel has been clear, right? We already know. He is Savior Christ the Lord. That word Christ, Christos, in the, in the Greek is the word Messiah. He's the rescuer, the savior, the long way to Messiah. And he's Lord, which means leader over all things. But here's what we didn't expect. We didn't expect him to come as a baby. And we surely didn't expect him to be wrapped up and placed in a manger. So the angel tells them, this is how this baby will be distinguished from all other babies. The scholars would tell us, you know, how many babies were born in Bethlehem? Several of us have been to Bethlehem. It's not a real big town, and it was even smaller at this time. There may have been no other newborns there that night, and surely no other newborns lying in a manger. So the shepherds could find him easily. But here's, here's the thing. Here's the truth underneath that. He is distinguished from all other babies that would ever been born or have been born. In fact, John, in his uh, gospel, he offers commentary on this from a very different angle. In his prologue, he says this, in the beginning, now check this out, he goes all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning was the word. Now you might know this, the word is the word logos, okay, logos in the Greek. The word was with God and the word was God. He, uh-oh. The word is a person, evidently. He was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. The Greeks understood the logos, the word, as the ultimate purpose behind all of life. I mean, this word was filled, loaded with meaning and it carried a lot of philosophical, cultural, even spiritual freight with it. The Logos was this principle they believed, a truth, we might say a force behind all of all things that exist. And so the whole point was to align yourself up with the Logos and you'd have this flourishing, meaningful life. Not a personal God, but a kind of principle, a truth behind it all. Now this showed up in various forms, you might know. The Stoics were those who thought, maybe it's an intellectual thing. That's how you get there. 
through education and through knowledge. Maybe it's like the Epicureans. It's through some form of pleasure in life that we would find our way and live the happy life. It had lots of iterations. But what John does here, listen to this. He makes an earth-shaking statement. This is an earthquake. He says that the truth behind all things is actually a person. And in verse 14, he says this. And the word, the logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and full of truth. This is the mystery of the incarnation. And friends, listen, it is a mystery. It's beyond what we can understand or grasp. It is God Almighty coming in the form of a person. How else would he communicate to us? This is the incarnation, the in the flesh, literally. The in the flesh of God because you see he is the savior he comes to us because we can't rescue ourselves if our great need had been entertainment then God would have sent I suppose an entertainer a comedian somehow to bring us pleasure if that was our great need if our greatest need in life was political stability he would have sent us a politician to save the day if it was economic stability He would have sent us a financier or an economist. If it was health, in the end, he would have sent us a doctor. But he knew. What we did not know, though we all know that it is true, I suppose. Our greatest need is our own profound rebellion against God and all that is right in the world. You don't have to be a Christian or a believer, even a theist, to know this. Our world is broken It's not the way it ought to be. And so he sends a savior who comes to rescue us from ourselves, from our own self-justification, from our own pride. He's a savior. That's who this gift is. He is God in the flesh. In Colossians 1, Paul would say, for in him, think about this, all the full, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. And through him, To reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, that covers everything, making peace by the blood of his cross. He would go on in Colossians 2, Paul would say, for in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. People say, Jeff, how do you know there's a God? He came here to tell us that he exists well how do you know what he's like he came here to show us okay so wait what is this gift it's God in the flesh he's the head over every power and authority he's bringing fullness to each of us he's come to restore all things and those of us who join him enter into the restoration of all things as well no wonder John would say we've seen him We've, we've seen the glory of almighty God in the person of Jesus. God comes to us in a way that is accessible to us. So what is this gift? He's, he's a person, God in the flesh. And what does it look like? Well, looks like a baby wrapped up in a manger. But what's underneath this? Clearly, that's how they're going to find this gift. But he's come in the flesh and the manger is a sign. The baby wrapped up is a sign. Watch this. To what he's like. Who is this king who's come? Well, look at how he comes. He comes quietly. He comes to a remote little town in a remote part of the world. He comes lowly, humble, to an unassuming, unremarkable couple. This is how he comes. And this tells us something about who he is. When we realize that this baby is God in the flesh, heaven come to earth, we realize that he's coming to show us what God is like. 
and how we are to live in the flesh as well. Paul would say in Philippians 2, he comes from the very top all the way down to where we are. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his advantage, something to be held on to. But instead, rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a criminal's cross. This gift is God writing himself into our story to save us, to rescue us from ourselves. And he looks a lot like a humble, unassuming baby who makes himself accessible to us. So how do you find it? How do you find him? Well, of course, the angel points out, here's the location, Bethlehem. Here's exactly how you're going to find this baby. But again, there's something much deeper going on here. Notice that he's not found in a palace. He's not found in the most expensive bassinet you can find. He's not found in the best hospital in the world. He's found among poor, nearly homeless parents who would find themselves as refugees on the run. Going off into Egypt to escape political oppression, genocide, infanticide. They would find themselves on the run. What's going on here? He's found to be gentle, to be lowly, to be accessible, to be approachable. Think about it. These shepherds, the lowest class really socially, God shows up to them. That tells us something. We are to identify with them as well to say, you know what? We might think we're all that and got it all together. We're the ones in need. We're like them. And consider this. The shepherds knew a little something about mangers. You see how God is meeting them right where they are? You're not going to find him in a palace, not, not in, in some, some special place. You're going to find him in a manger. And they're thinking, we know about mangers. Mangers were a part of their everyday life, part of their vocation. And he says, you're going to find him right where you are. You see, they're not going to come rushing into a palace, are they? They knew they didn't belong in in a palace rushing to see a king. They're not going to rush past a company of angels to, to go to the great king, the leader. But they'll come to a manger. They'll come to a baby. Who's afraid of a baby, right? Everybody wants to look at a baby. So he invites them to come and say, look at this. And he's telling us something through this. He's telling us that he's come humble. He's come among those who are poor in spirit. In fact, Jesus, this baby would grow up and say, the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Those who will humble themselves, they'll find the king. Those who don't, will not. John tells us not everybody's going to come to this king. Because some of us cannot lay down our pride. See, do you want to find him? then you become like this holy family. You want to find him? You become like the shepherds. You just give up your pride and you admit your need because watch this, necessity finds him out. The greatest Christmas prayer that you could offer today, really the first prayer of any believer that would come to him is help. And I know our congregation well enough, many of you here, or I know, how about this, all of us in varying degrees, the great prayer we could offer today on this day of days, help, Lord help, we need you, we are desperate for you in this world. David, another shepherd, would write in Psalm 51 verse 17, A contrite and broken spirit you will not despise. What is he saying? Friends, hear this. 
God has never turned his back on someone who comes to him broken, in need to say help. Because you see, even our sin doesn't, doesn't repel him. Our brokenness actually triggers his love towards us. It's why he came. While we were yet sinners, he comes. But watch this. Don't miss this. Every sign that we see, and you might know even the book of John, he, there are these seven miracles that Jesus does, and he says it was a sign. That was a sign pointing to who he is, who the kingdom is, and what his kingdom looks like. Jesus went around healing people, not simply like some great magic show. He did so to show us what the kingdom is like. People are not lame in my kingdom. People are not broken in my kingdom. There's no death in my kingdom. And so he steps into that to show us what kind of king is and to show us what the kingdom is like. But don't miss this. Because it's a sign, it's a stumbling block. And many will not believe. Because it's too much. Because it takes faith. And this is what trips us up. You see, he says, come to me by faith. And we want to bring our own strength, right? We want to bring our own intellect. We want to bring our resources to the table because we want to take a little credit for the fact that we got there. And he says, no, this gift is free. This little baby would grow up to show us where he's found. Don't miss this. This is where he's still found today. Jesus would come alongside a woman at the well and say, your relationships, I mean, you're a mess. And, 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 and I'm here to show you there's a, there's, there's a living water that will never run dry. There's life for you. He comes alongside the woman caught in adultery. He says, no, no one condemns you. I don't condemn you. But listen, turn to me for life and go and sin no more. There's a better way to live. He comes alongside Mary and Martha, grieving alongside of them when they lose their brother, as many have lost loved ones this year. And he weeps with us. He touches the leper. He heals the broken hearted. He is the friend of sinners. This is where he's found. And this is where we still find him. You see, friends, don't miss this. The best of Christianity is incarnate it's in person that's where he's found when we decide to join him in the restoration of all things coming alongside broken hurting people and could it be in our own families that we just love each other for free Jesus told a story about where he'd be found and at the end of it he says this the king referring to himself will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Jesus so identifies with the poor, the broken, the needy, the prisoner, those who've been ostracized by society. He so identifies with them. He says, when you come alongside them, when you serve them, you will find me. You'll be serving me. This is why as a church, as Rodney noted earlier, we are in the poorest parts of our city and in places around the world where people are desperate, who feel ostracized, oppressed, where there's injustice. We step into that place with the good news of the gospel because that's where Jesus is and we want to be found with him. This is the life he's called you to. Not simply that you'd be saved and zapped up to heaven someday. Christianity is, yes, you are saved, conformed into his image. And those of us who are being conformed to his image, join him in the restoration of all things. He's renewing everything. He's making everything right. And he's called us now in the present to join him in doing so. See, the problem in America, it seems to me, is that many people claim Christian identity, not Christian community. We see this in spades at Christmas time. 
Christianity means that we join as family and we serve each other. We love each other. It's faith and practice that starts together in the body of Christ. We become the visible picture of his love. What is this gift? It's God in the flesh who's come to rescue us and calls us to join him. What does it look like? It looks like love in human form. Caring for others. It looks humble and loving. And yes, it looks like it's, it's broken and in need. It's a humble posture that says, I want to serve others. I want to give my life to that. Friends, don't waste your life. Life is found in joining the family of God and serving others. Jesus is the gift. But like any gift, don't miss this. You must receive it. For it to be a gift. And like any gift, it comes to you for free. Because Jesus, the light of the world, has come into the darkness. And John tells us that the darkness didn't want the light. And some of us, even here today, I want to ask, will you receive the light? The logos, the purpose, the meaning behind it all comes to us in a person who shows us how to live. We conform into his image by receiving his grace, first of all. Because John says this in John 1 verse 12. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. To join his family. Because, listen, he came To live the perfect life for you because you could not. He came as your substitute. Not simply your good example. He died on the cross for you so you wouldn't have to die. Taking on your shame, your punishment. To make you right with God. We receive that by faith. We bring nothing to the table. And we say yes to him. And then he calls us to join him. He was raised again so that we might too be raised up like him and then to follow him in this triumphal procession into eternity and join him in the restoration of all things. He's called us to this. This is what Christmas is all about. The great gift that has come to you and on this day of days, I wonder, would you settle it with him and come to him and renew your commitment to him maybe for the first time in your life? To say yes to him. Let's pray together. Friend, right where you are, Christmas prayer. With your heads bowed and eyes closed. He is the gift that has come to you. Have you received his gift? By faith, not by your works. Praise him. Not because you're smart enough. Not because you're good enough. He comes and you receive him by faith. Would you do so even now? To say, Lord, I'm sorry for seeking my own validation, self-justification. I lay down my pride. I come humbly, broken, and in need. Rescue me as I join you to be conformed into the image of your likeness, of your son and how you lived So God, we give you our lives and we join you as we seek to love others around us and love others to you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.